classroom instruction or thank you or um either as in classroom or as an extracurricular or maybe co-teaching uh, so that is something I have heard, and I'm trying to put something together for you sooner rather than later so that it's easier for you to implement it into the beginning of your school year. So I'm hoping August or September. Make sure to follow us on social media. We're pretty active on Instagram um, and Facebook. So if you want to find Tennessee History Day there, and we'll make sure to kind of put that information out to you. And we also send out a newsletter once a month um, with upcoming PDs and, and things that we're offering. So that is kind of how we'll get that information to you. Um, a lot of you wanted a timeline of how to, how do you implement this? What does it look like? What steps, when? And that's something we're gonna be putting together for you. We did find some really great timelines from other historical societies that, um, or other uh, institutions that do History Day. Um, you do have to kind of take that with within the context of our timeline. Some other places do theirs a um, little later than ours. So we're gonna be working on one for you. We do a list of Tennessee topics every year. Uh, some of you were asking for Tennessee specific topics for this year's theme. That is something that we do and it is on our website. Tori's been working on it and it'll be available to you uh, late summer, early fall. I know Tennessee State Library and Archives puts together resources every year based on the theme. I've been talking with Kelly, who's over uh, education coordinator at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. So that's something they're working on as well. And uh, TPS will be speaking on sources for you next week too, and how to dig into their website and find sources um, for students. So we do have that coming for you. And then there were some questions from yesterday as far as student buy-in. A lot of you mentioned I would like to do this. How do I get my kids to want to do this? Uh, which is a wonderful question. Um, I do think from my experience, being able to show students other work, so a documentary, um, exhibit boards, pictures from History Day, videos from a History Day event, which are all available online, um, gets them excited to participate. I do think also, um, the autonomy of choice, getting to help pick their topic makes them excited. But how do you get them initially there? Um, if you are a History Day teacher and you have any insight into that, feel free to pop that in the chat and um, it can be later as well. Um, but that is a great question and is something that um, I'm hoping we can answer for you with something I'm trying to put together um, in August or September. Ways to keep costs down, also a really good question. A big thing with that would be um, doing it locally, uh, keeping it at your school. And um, eventually, if you're able to get school buy-in or um, community buy-in, they can maybe help fund you to go to your regional or potentially state contests. But there's no problem with keeping it local, keeping it in the school building, making an exhibit hall in the library. Um, doing digital exhibits, doing just website, doing just paper, um, starting small and then building from there as you kind of build momentum within your school program. Uh, and then ways to keep the workload for educators reasonable. Co-teach is the big thing I could think of. Finding another educator who sees the value in the History Day project and the work that students end up doing and sharing that workload and responsibility. Having a club and then splitting the kids by topic or grade level, work with a drama teacher, work with an ELA teacher. Um, I think being able to get the insight of another adult and also the, you know, just accountability the kids need from more than one person sometimes when it comes to getting stuff done uh, can be very helpful. And if, one, you know, if anybody has any other advice or insight, um, please feel free to share. So our agenda for the day, we are going to be talking just in general, what is the rubric? Um, how are you guys already using these in your classes? What is an instructional rubric in the NHD context? Historical vocabulary and judge feedback. And then we are going to do a really quick practice session with uh, student work. Uh, a lot of you mentioned wanting to see more student product, so that's something we are going to be doing today. So what is a History Day 
judging process like? So as far as judges, we do a big orientation with them, make sure they understand the rules uh, and what their function in this process is. This is actually a slide from one of our judging orientation videos. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the rubrics in two different contexts today. So, cause they do serve two different purposes, I think. Um, how do the judges use them? And how do the students use them? And how do you use them? Um, because not only are they how they score your students' work, but they also guide students as they edit and rework their projects. So we're gonna kind of look at those two different perspectives on the same thing today. Um, this is information that we give the judges when we talk through rubrics on judging day. The most important thing that they need to know is that historical quality and relation to theme over here in the 80%. It used to be 60, 20, 20, and now it's all lumped together there in that 80%. They really want them to focus there. We tell them not to get hung up on things like clarity of presentation and errors that can be fixed. Things like typos or a glue smear or improper formatting. That can be corrected before they move on to the next level. We want them to really dig into the work that students are presenting and finding feedback that is helpful for them and not just, well, I didn't really like your border. <laughs> okay, I, I need to know about the quality of student work. So that is kind of um, where judges are coming from on History Day itself. The function of the rubric during actual judging is the evaluate, it's so that uh, sources can be, evaluating sources can be streamlined and it can be equitable as, as equitable as possible and the same for all students. They use the same rubric. There is a different rubric for each category because there are some differences between category, but in general, the language is the same. It helps deter bias based on topic because you cannot argue with the way it scores on the sheet itself even if you really don't want to read about submarines in World War II anymore, it's still, you are using that to deter your bias. You are looking at how the work itself scored on that sheet. It also helps keep judges focused, just like, you know, eighth graders, <laughs> they can get uh, excited and talking about stuff with their groups and um, it helps keep them focused on the task at hand. In general, so some feedback from this year. This is our first year with this new rubric. In general, it seems like educators say they found the new rubrics were helpful to create um, stronger projects and deeper understanding of historical themes and skills within that framework. Oh. Letting some people in. Um, so making sure that the new, the rubrics this year, and I realized I didn't have a picture of what they used to look like. They used to just have historical accuracy, superior, excellent, fair, and you just kind of marked which one it was. Now they have like criterion within each box. So it helps there not be a misunderstanding between judging groups of what superior looks like. It is much more clear. Within that, your students are able to find deeper understanding of what those boxes are looking for, what they're looking for within these projects. They also say students kind of enjoyed the depth of feedback because not only was it helping kids, it was helping judges write their feedback better um, because it wasn't just, oh, your annotated bibliography was, wasn't what it needs to look like. They could actually point to and use language from that rubric to be clear about how students move from one box to the next box. Um, in general, and um, educators that participated this year, you can let me know if I'm wrong, but um, most students struggled with the idea of multiple perspectives and then the idea of student voice. Student voice is new this year and um, it some kids really struggled with it and it can be hard to um, find the time to really slow down and talk about what that means within their work. So we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit today. All right. So this is what they look like. We're going to look at these a little bit more in depth later. Some of you may have found these last night after our session, um, but it's two-sided form if we're in person and I'm handing you a physical form. Otherwise, it's two pages online. You have your 80% on the front with entry information at the top, 
the historical quality criteria in the boxes and then comment space at the bottom, strengths and areas for improvement. And then on the back is clarity of presentation, which is 20%. That is written, um, you know, your visuals um, and the presentation itself, as well as like things like technical stuff, um, your set, if you're doing um, or your documentary itself, like kind of the technical pieces of whatever category you've chosen. And then also a space for comments as well as rules compliance. So rules compliance um, sometimes really trips kids up because um, it, digging into those rules can be hard <laughs> to find the time to make sure you've done everything. Um, but looking at the rubric beforehand, this is available to everybody to look at before contest day. So using the back side of it to make sure that you, you are within, yes, on all of them is very helpful. So I am curious, um, how do you guys use rubrics in your classrooms currently? It doesn't have to be history day. <laughs> um, if any of you are using any type of form to help kids give, them, give themselves feedback, or you are using them to score a project, um, essay writing, project-based learning. All right. Um, I know that when I was teaching, I worked pretty closely with my ELA team teacher to create rubrics that aligned with what he was trying to hit in his classroom at the time. And um, it helped the kids seeing that language in two different spaces so that they know that those skills are not just for Mr. Nagy's classroom. They can come to Ms. B's classroom and also use the things that they were learning. Um, media projects, group projects, they're really helpful for group projects. So um, self-assessment, modified rubric for writing, very, very helpful. This is a great way to modify for kids that maybe just aren't getting it and need a little bit of help. Grade, they're, they help with grading having kids grade their own work, um, rubric survey, score each other, participation and performance in group projects. Yeah, the accountability piece of them is really helpful too. So I'm gonna talk to you guys about what is an instructional rubric. Um, with the purpose of an instructional rubric, a lot of group projects, yeah, that can be really helpful for, especially if you have kids that are determined to work together. <laughs> Um, it can be really helpful to use the history day rubrics already um, to help them make sure they are all on the same page of where they are headed. As soon as they pick their project, I give them a, yeah, that really helps to help them plan their project. Self-assessment and group assessment, great. So hopefully this, this stuff transfers easily to how you are already doing things. Um, so the purpose of an instructional rubric is to give students inform informative feedback about their works in progress and to give detailed evaluations of their final project. So what you're using an instructional rubric in this context for is to help them, it's not for a grade, it is to help them view the work where it's at and see what they need to do to make it better. And um, they can be used by you as the educator, by their peers uh, on their work that they're seeing. Um, and they can also, I think it's really important for them to be using them themselves to self-assess their work, especially when they know it's not tied to their grade. Um, it can be hard for kids to understand when a rubric or a primary means of assigning a grade to let go of that idea and that this is just, we're working on this to make it better, not to give you a grade on the work at this moment and that they have multiple uses. Um, another thing about an instructional rubric is it can take the mystery out of the assignment and the expectation. Uh, some students really want to do what they want to do the right thing. <laughs> they really want to make sure. Um, I had students that really struggled with making edits because they felt like they did. They failed instead of understanding that this is a process and you're going to have to make edits a whole bunch. And that's OK. That's the point. Um, it takes the kind of mystery out of that and they know what's expected of them. And they can help them, um, students that struggle to focus a little bit better when they're feeling overwhelmed, they can pick a section and zone in on that section. And I've actually made some stuff to help you with students that maybe don't need to see the whole rubric at once and need to just see one section of it um, to help them set clear steps to grow. 
So um, I've what I've ended up doing this year for you is um, snipped and made a little form for your use. Um, these are available on our educator toolkit for you. So um, the function of this is to inform your decisions about your project moving forward. And it kind of removes the label from the top to help kids focus on the content of the square. I mean, they still know which one's superior, but at least it's not like sitting there, right? And uh, it zones in on one section at a time. So it gives students room to qualify their choices at the bottom. Why did this score in the second box? What caused it to not score in the third box? What caused it to not score in the first box? Um, seeing them analyze why is my work where it's at right now? And how do I move it up? This can be a really great tool if you want to just hand this to a kid <laughs> and then meet with them later so that you are kind of on the same page and they have had time to reflect on their own work. Um, if you're doing a club, this can be something they do before they come to that next meeting is they pick one of these instructional rubrics, I've done one for each, and they kind of dig into that specific section. Um, giving what caused them, um, the rubrics are, these are written for kids. I think the important thing to think about with the big rubric, who is that written for? That's written for judges. That's not written for students. So how do we make this accessible for kids and not overwhelmed by the language that they're seeing, but also give them ownership of that language so that they can feel confident when they're talking with you about their work and they can say, okay, I see why this is a basic historical argument um, and I need to move it to the next box take it beyond just the basic argument there. Make sure I'm hitting all my notes here. Um, because I, I strongly believe in the function of a rubric to help you build a language together, working on that historical vocabulary so that kids do find strength in the words that they're choosing to use when they talk about their own work. Um, it gets them familiar with the language that they hear from you, take this, add words in it that you want them to be using in your classroom. Um, if you have specific social studies practices that you're really trying to hit with them, change some of the questions at the bottom so that it fits your needs. Uh, and that way it's, it's serving two functions for you. Um, talk with writing teachers as well, other social science teachers, make sure that uh, the language that they're using for um, whatever writing unit that they're doing can be used within this as well so that they kind of gain confidence outside of just that one space. It also helps by the time they receive feedback from the judges, they know what the judges are talking about. They're not mystified by the use of um, annual theme woven throughout the project. Like, what does that mean? Um, they are, have a little bit more confidence going into that feedback because feedback is scary. <laughs> um, and if you can kind of take away a little bit of that fear of not even knowing what they're talking about, that can be really helpful by the time they do get feedback from somebody that's not you. Um, let's see. I also really like the idea of an instructional rubric and in that it gives students the opportunity for choice so that they can choose which section they're wanting to work on. Um, any opportunity for that autonomy of choice, I think is helpful because it gives them a little bit of kind of ownership over something. Um, and it makes the growth visible through words and not just numbers. Um, seeing that movement can be really helpful. And if you wanna see what that looks like, it's here and you can just download it as a PDF, open it in a new window if you'd like snip pieces of it. Um, what I ended up doing is at the top that um, just talking about how you feel about historical argument itself right now, one through four, um, I can help others eventually or even with help I don't get it. Um, why is my work not rated higher than my current score? If I scored a two, why is it not a three? Why is it not rated lower? If I scored a two, why is it not a one? Then using language from the rubric, what steps can you take to improve your work? These steps need to be actionable. Explain how you're going to do these steps. Don't just say, I'm gonna write better. Great, 
How? How are you going to make that better? And then um, personal goals, giving them an opportunity to say, I want to work on my grammar or my spelling was really bad. And I'm, you know, so that there's things outside of history day um, that they can use. Yeah, Reed, we can throw that in the chat again. So that is, um, that is the history day, that is the um, series Padlet. That's where you're gonna find all of the sources for all four, week, all four of our sessions. Um, and if you hit the top of yesterday, the educator toolkit, it brings you to this Padlet for you guys for this year, which is just history day, um, everything you might need to kind of get started, um, including those checklists we talked about yesterday for each. They're really, really great. I think you actually mentioned that, Reed, using these checklists to make sure they're ready to go. Um, but that's where you find the instructional rubrics there for each category. All right. Um, how did make it work for you guys? So um, I know I'm, this isn't new information, like using rubrics is helpful for students and teachers. This isn't groundbreaking, but um, it, it is something that it can, you can make work for yourself. Let's see, Amanda said, having a rubric written in a way they understand helps the student understand exactly what they need and it's not confusing, exactly. Yeah, and it helps them understand why they're, why they're scoring the way they're scoring. And if they're, if they're scoring themselves before they go to a contest, it makes the contest less like shocking sometimes. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Use the stuff where use the stuff we're providing you and make it work for you. Edit as needed, um, but let us help you by at least giving you a jumping off point. Use it as a means of modifying the assignment for students that maybe need a little bit of assistance in certain areas. They are just not getting wide research. Let's spend a little bit more time just looking at that chunk so that they're not once again overwhelmed by the entire page. Um, use them in conjunction with ELA practices you're already using in your classroom, um, historical practices that you're already using, highlight relevant criterion in your work. I'm sure everybody has heard of this or done this where if we're looking at this one thing, I'm gonna go through and highlight every place I've done that um, with a different color even, and that can be helpful. As it relates to History Day, remembering and telling the kids, this is the judge's tool for evaluation. The better you understand this tool, the better it's gonna help you do. If you have kids that are highly motivated for the contest and they want to win, getting them to understand that if you're not looking at this rubric before you go to that contest, you're not gonna score well. You need to make sure you're looking at this to know how to kind of work that um, system, essentially. You are using this rubric that they are going to be using. You already can see it. Don't ignore the 20% on the back. Sometimes it can be easy to forget about the written work section, the materials section. Um, the 80% is more important. That's why it's 80%, but don't forget about that 20. And then using this as a means for student voice, getting to make some decisions about their own work, um, getting to make kind of a, an analyzed decision about, okay, where do I need to be focusing on right now? If I need to slow down, let me know. Um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. The more your students become familiar with the language on these rubrics prior to the contest, the less time you're gonna spend um, interpreting judge feedback. And they already have a little bit more um, ownership of the language that they're seeing so that they feel more confident understanding what that judge is trying to tell them. Especially since we're all looking at the same words now, you are going to find judges, hopefully, because this is what we're asking of them, use language from the rubric to make sure students know what you're asking of them to do to make their work better. Make sure that it's clear to them. And we also talk about actionable feedback. This past year, had an HD groups grade, a handful of previous year's project. Yeah. Effective strategy, they dug into their own research. Yeah, that's great. Um, so being able to take this in advance and make sure kids are kind of on the same page is really helpful. Um, 
It also makes sure that they are speaking that same language by the time feedback arrives in your inbox and encourages students to use that language they see here as they talk about their own work and outside of the History Day world. You want to see them using, if you are doing this in your classroom, you want to see it show up in other assessments that you're giving, not just History Day stuff, so that you do see evidence in your own class of, is this framework helping me? Um, so making sure that you're using the language there to benefit them. And also in instructional rubrics, like I said, add stuff in from your own classroom. If there's language you want them to be using, put that in there so that they become more confident with it. Okay, so we are going to spend a little bit of time um, breaking apart the rubric itself. Um, and looking at the categories here. Um, so if anybody, um, do we need to take a break? Or are we good to keep going? I think I'm good, so, okay. Um, so we're gonna look at historical argument first. I did pull these from the exhibit category. So, um, but really in general, the front side is all the same. Um, so it should kind of read similarly across the categories. So historical argument, um, it's important to remember that the blank box at the end is no evidence. Um, and then it starts uh, next to that. And as you move to the left, your work is growing stronger. So they're gonna be moving hopefully towards the left as they go through the contest cycle. Um, so we'll start over at the side. I'll give you a minute to kind of look through it. Weak historical argument, no little to no analysis. Annual theme is unclear. Basic historical argument, annual theme is mentioned. Historical argument is supported by some analysis. It's addressed in the project. Well formulated historical argument supported by a thorough analysis. Annual theme is woven throughout the project. So you can already see, I would know my kids would be like, well, what's the difference between woven throughout and addressed? Um, so being able to look at that in advance and talk with kids beforehand. But big things to remember with historical argument for you is there an argument there or are they just saying information? <laughs> are they just stating facts? Is it something you can disagree with? Is there something in the work that they have claimed as an argument that can be disagreed with? Um, they're looking for that thorough analysis of the topic. Does it connect to the theme clearly throughout the project? They're not like last year it was communication. You can't just slap the word communication in your title and be like, done, did it. You have to make sure that they have made an argument throughout their project that this is a key to communication, that communication within this event helped affect history, and then proving that. Um, do we hear students' originality of thought within the work? Um, we don't want them to just rely on secondary primary sources. Because remember, I said this yesterday, history without an argument is just an encyclopedia. So making sure kids are what, what is your point? That so what question teachers are always asking. So what, what is your argument? Wide research. Tori is gonna talk a little bit about wide research for us. Okay, so um, if y'all look at the uh, scoring, um, it's pretty uh, straightforward to us, I guess, but what the wide research really refers to is the variety of sources that students are using um, in their research. And this applies to both primary and secondary sources. So it really needs to en encompass both of them. Um, another thing, students might feel like they need a, uh, a certain number of um, primary sources or sources or a minimum number, but this is not the case. There's really no, um, magic number to how many uh, sources they need. It's it's really um, quality over quantity is the key um, in your wide research. Um, a, lot of, a lot of issues that come from this are um, students will use uh, all their primary sources will be images or, or photos or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it needs, there needs to be more of a variety there. Um, and this is hard, especially for ancient history topics, um, which is always a really difficult uh, topic to choose. Um, and also the range of sources needs to be pretty evident in the 
argument that they're making in their historical argument. Um, and the wide, wide research sort of will also go hand in hand with multiple uh, perspectives, which we'll get to later, um, because obviously uh, a true variety of sources will, will kind of automatically give you a variety of perspectives in a way. So you can go to the next one. Um, so primary sources. Um, this will this refers really to how those primary sources are used. Um, if you notice the difference in the higher two scoring um, levels, uh, the difference is primary sources that support the historical argument versus primary sources that develop. Um, so what does that really mean? Like for students, that could be really kind of confusing. Um, but it's really more about, is it clear whether the student used the primary sources as an addition to their argument or is their work actually centered around what the sources they found tell them um, about their topic or about the argument they want to make? Um, and this can be kind of hard to determine, but it's usually pretty, um, it's, it's easier to see in the annotated bibliography for the most part, you can kind of tell. Um, which uh, whether they're supporting their argument with sources or they're actually developing a more rounded argument um, with those sources. That's good, you can go to the next one. All right, so historical context. <clears throat> um, we're, when we're looking at this one, we're seeing that, are they just identifying people and places are they explaining the cause of the event? Are they identifying short-term and long-term causes of the event? Or are they analyzing those short-term and long-term? So the difference, the big one here is going from just pointing to it to analyzing and interpreting um, those short-term and long-term events. Historical context is the larger setting in which your topic took place. You guys know that. Um, what is going on that would have had an impact on the topic? Um, whether that be social, cultural, economic, religious, political movements, norms of the time, pointing out change over time, whether that be caused by the event, caused by outside forces. Um, we know history doesn't occur in a vacuum. So if they're presenting a topic, we need to talk about the surrounding world of that thing. And judges look for that context because without context, your project is incomplete. And kids need to make sure it's grounded in that time period. Um, Dr. Gorn, who is the executive director of History Day, she's all, she always says no context, no contest. Because if you do have a kid that's very motivated for History Day and wants to go to a contest, they have to have context evident in not only the project, but also their source material, their bibliography. And um, otherwise, they're, it's just not going to score well. Um, you have to make sure that they have told the full story of how their, their thing is relevant. Why is it significant? To understand significance, you have to understand historical context. And there is a whole section on historical significance. So those go together um, pretty, pretty closely. Um, this is something that is also available to you in the resources. It's the 2022 topic funnel. So at the top, it says debate and diplomacy, successes, failures, and consequences, which is the theme for the year. Um, and it kind of helps them narrow in their focus because you might have a kid that's like, I want to talk about, you know, something very vague. Um, and from there, they can say their general interest. They can go into a broader topic, something more specific, narrow in that topic some more, from there, their narrow topic, they can say, okay, this is what I'm going to be researching. And then they should not be filling in that historical argument until they've done their research. So this is a stepped process, right? They're not going to sit down and fill out this in one go. They, they needs to be work in between each of these steps. <clears throat> and this is something to help them narrow in their focus. So they're not just like women in World War II. Like, well, you got you to really make sure you're focusing in on something specific. Um, and it also can help you point out 
Okay. My apology. Siri's listening to me. Um, it can also help you point out, is that something that's relevant to the theme since the theme is up there at the top? Um, is that a debate or diplomacy? Are we seeing, are you pointing out the failure of this diplomatic attempt? Um, or are you just wanting to talk about something that you find interesting? <laughs> Um, so making sure that they're kind of connecting all those pieces together. This is available to you right here. So, and also, like I said, take the idea, change it, do what you need to with it to make it work for you in your setting. All right, multiple perspectives. This ties really well with wide, wide research um, because if you're if you're going to have multiple perspectives in your work, you need to be, your research will already be wide. Um, so does it provide only one perspective? Does it include more than one perspective? Does it demonstrate how multiple perspectives shape the topic? Or does it integrate multiple perspectives throughout the historical argument? So we see argument added in there at the end. It can be really challenging to get kids to understand the nuance between the third square and the fourth square. Um, so I've tried to highlight words that are important for them to focus on. So is it integrating those perspectives throughout with their historical argument, or is it just demonstrating that multiple perspectives existed? Um, a perspective is one point of view or one side of the story. So different sides to the story means sources that offer different points of view. Students need to be the detective here. Who is involved in this story? How do I, and this can be challenging. Um, how do I make sure that their voice and their experience is in this historical work that I'm doing. Um, and a lot of that comes to really heavy detective work with primary sources and um, giving them kind of the tools that they need to look for those sources that they uh, can use to help tell that story. All right, Tori's gonna talk a little bit about historical accuracy. All right, so for um, historical accuracy, uh, this one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I think it's a pretty uh, basic standard for a history competition, um, but this is where it's really important for students to recognize um, the difference between you know, credible sources and more unreliable sources so that they don't get confused um, and end up you know, putting something inaccurate in their project. Um, and this can actually be a sort of common issue um, with students that want to include an oral history uh, that they conduct themselves in their project. Like, for instance, if they want to interview um, like their grandfather or, or a family member or someone um, as a secondary source, um, they might make the mistake and, you know, take everything uh, from that interview as historical fact. Um, you know, even though it's really just a secondary source technically. Um, so it's it's good to make sure students are careful with that kind of thing. Um, also just in general with an, a project as a whole, if there's just one or, or two, you know, kind of small inaccuracies in a project, the entire credibility of the project itself could come into question uh, with the judges. And, um, and so you wanna just make sure that you know, that's kind of a simple fix. So um, you want to make sure that the students don't make, you know, um, a careless mistake like that and then end up compromising uh, the credibility of their entire project as a whole. Yeah, I was talking to Tori earlier about how historical accuracy kind of appears in the classroom. And at least in the middle school setting, what I struggled with was kids, you know, they're just beginning to learn how to analyze information and, and um, having a kid tell me that when I was asking on an assessment about why, um, what is the significance of uh, art in tombs in ancient Egypt? And why is that important to historians today? And he was telling me about how it's like painted in blood and things like, it's just, you know, like just things that he thought that were true, that he was throwing in there that made me wonder about the scores of the rest of his test, like, okay. Um, it also helps me see where I need to evaluate a little bit better um, the understanding what we're talking about and making sure that we're not just taking in information. And within this work, 
how can I point to it being accurate? Um, but I will say historical accuracy is a pretty easy square to make sure they are um, getting it right. I did throw in there because she mentioned um, oral interviews. NHD does a really good job because that can get a little fuzzy. Um, there are really good guidelines for conducting those interviews. Um, significance in history. So this can be helpful when you have a student that's really interested in a current event or topic for their project. Um, see if you can help them kind of walk it back to an origin and making sure that um, the long-term effect is, um, it may be the long, it may be itself the long-term effect of something larger from the past. Um, so if you have a kid that's really focused on something, helping walk them back a little bit um, can be helpful. So it refers to the impact or consequences of the topic that you've chosen, short-term and long-term, which is mentioned in several of the rubric sections you've seen so far. Um, this might change the topic that you pick. They may find something that is a little more interesting within that same kind of historical space that they would rather do that might be easier to find sources for. Um, and within historical significance, like I said earlier, the important thing here is, are you answering that so what question within the work? Are you explaining why this impacted history? And is that clear within my work? Don't just state facts and expect your reader to make the connections for you. Um, it's your job as the historian to connect those dots. So within that, you also need to be showing the resources that you used to make those connections making sure that you are credible. Here's the sources that I used within my argument and my significance here. Um, and it is one of those boxes that has two different things within it. So it attempts to draw a conclusion and sh explain one or the other. It does draw a conclusion. It draws a reasoned conclusion, which that means that there's a reason behind it. So there's sources that they're kind of pointing to or it draws an evidence-based conclusion about the topic's significance in history. So it's not just that you think that they're pointing to sources, it is clear within the work itself that is drawing from evidence to make this conclusion. And it analyzes the short-term and long-term impact instead of just explaining what analysis, there's student voice there, what analysis are they adding to that as the historian? All right, and I've said this a million times. So student voice um, is really, it, it was really challenging for kids this year, it seems. Um, so thinking back to that film yesterday, um, those of you that were able to join us yesterday, there's no way to misinterpret her voice within that work um, because she said something was preposterous, right? Like she was making a claim, her voice was evident, her opinion and her argument was there. Um, let's see, he's noticed that significance in history can really serve as a platform for weaving the annual theme. Yeah, so being able to point to the significance and making sure that, you know, debate and diplomacy is tied to that significance and getting the kids to understand that and looking for that throughout their work. It's a great point. Um, so student voice at its core is that the student ideas are present. So it's, um, is it difficult to find their voice within that work? Are they just showing you a timeline and, or an encyclopedia kind of style work? Are they using, do their ideas reflect, are they just using secondary sources to kind of form their, their idea and their voice? Um, are their ideas distinct from the research or are they original and persuasive? Like, are they making a very clear argument is it original, but evidence-based? Um, and it's not just ideas, it's also analysis, conclusions, that argument. Um, it's new and a lot of kids kind of felt confused by it, it seems, at least in some of the conversations I had with kids preparing for the next level of competition. And um, your argument and your supporting analysis needs to be clear in the project. What does the student add to the analysis? Can they highlight their own thoughts within the work or are they just highlighting the words of other historians? And secondary sources should support the project, but it's not who's speaking for the student. And that can be the really easy thing for kids to do because it can be hard to kind of put yourself out there and make a claim. So making sure they understand that the secondary sources are great to help you understand primary sources, but it shouldn't speak for you. So where is your voice as the historian within this work? And can you highlight where your voice is located? Um, let me know if you have any other questions about student voice. I will say there's a really great video. 
and um, on the toolkit, if you go over here, um, they have some quick tip videos. One of them is on student voice and they do a good job of showing an example of that. And you can share that with your kids. It's from NHD on their YouTube. Um, there's other here as well, historical context, multiple perspectives. So those are a great way to kind of, you don't have to do all the talking. <laughs> um, let NHD help you out a little bit there. Okay, so we are going to try to do um, a quick analysis of, yeah, I like, I do think it's important that their voice be there instead of just, because then it lends itself to it just being, like I said, you know, them stating historical information. So this makes sure them, they know that it's important for the judges to see their voice as the historian within the work. Because we can say that to them all day long until they see that on the rubric and the judging criteria you know, some kids won't do it because they're too afraid to really step out there and, and make a claim sometimes. So we are going to look at um, one of uh, a student website uh, that actually went to nationals this year. Um, we, so let me pop this over here for you guys. And then um, let me find the rubric as well. So this is the, um, is this exhibit or is it? Nope, this is, I need to do the website. So here is the website rubric for you as well as the website itself. Um, and they did theirs on, so last year it was communication and history, the key to understanding. They did theirs on living room war, how communication through multimedia changed public perception of the Vietnam War. And uh, you can see at the top, they used the NHD Web Central. They have sections here. I'm going to encourage you to start with the bibliography and process paper, which um, for websites is embedded in the website itself, uh, because that's what judges start with. Um, and kind of briefly skim through it, look at their process paper, look at their annotated bibliography. As you're looking at their annotated bibliography, remember that judges are told that this should not just be telling me what the source is, it needs to be telling me how you use the source, was it a useful source, how did it shape your work. Um, and then go through and kind of look at the other tabs and then look over at that rubric and see how you might score it. I have pulled the way it scored at state and the way it scored at nationals. This is their final product. This is what they sent to nationals. So there were some edits made between state and nationals. So you'll keep that in mind. Um, but I figured we could spend 15 minutes or so on this. So if we want to come back at 1110, um, I think you can kind of, so just mute yourself, you can turn your screen off if you'd like, and I'll do a two minute warning um, when we're ready to come back. Um, and if you get back a little early, you can just kind of let me know in the chat. But let me know if you have any questions throughout, I'll be kind of monitoring the chat. But if you want to go ahead and dig into this, and we can talk about it in a moment.
All right, we have about three more minutes um, and then we'll kind of come back together and, and see what you guys thought about um, the uh, process of looking through a, a work critically with the new rubric. All right, so I'm going to um, put the website rubric up on the screen really quick. You can kind of look at, I know this was a very short amount of time, um, but you can kind of get a quick idea of how this might be placed on the rubric, how you might place this on the rubric based on what we talked about earlier, um, both sides of it here. But I do have um, feedback from uh, how they did. So this is um, the how it was scored by one judge. There's a team of three judges. They each get autonomy in their choice. And um, it's a consensus. So they come together, compare how they scored, talk about why they scored what in the way that they did, and then um, come together to place the room from whatever to one. Um, so this is how one judge scored their work at the state level. Um, and you can see that um, they thought that they, you know, did pretty well. They scored pretty well at state, um, at least with this one judge. And um, it looked like some of the stuff they really wanted them to focus on were more primary sources, multiple perspectives, and then the significance in history, um, pointing out how, you um, the kind of larger world surrounding um, this point in the Vietnam era. Um, and student voice, their ideas are distinct from research, but they're not um, kind of making any major claims um, that are evident within their work. Uh, and then this is some of the feedback that they got from the judges. So overall, great job with this project, wide range of resources. They pointed out some typos go back over that text. Some of it doesn't really relate as clearly to your thesis or topic. Make a stronger connection between the memorial wall and the theme of communication if you're going to include it. They thought it seemed kind of random. Um, context for some of the photos, so it's clear why they support their thesis. They're not just putting pictures to put pictures, but what is the purpose of that picture? What argument are you making with that picture? Um, it starts to become a project just about the Vietnam War in general and not the impact media had on that public perception. And then they pointed out some source stuff they needed to work on. And this is how they did it national. So you can see the national judges are um, a, seemed a little more critical of their work. Um, 
once again, though, they're looking at work of um, their rooms are 10 kids. So they are up against um, nine other websites in their first round. They placed fifth in that first round. So if they placed third, they would have gone an honorable mention. Um, and then um, first moved on to the final round there. Second and third are honorable mentions there. So um, we can see they um, marked them more at the good end there and were a little more critical of their um, sources, historical context, significance in history, things like that. Now this is just one judge's form, um, but it is interesting to see um, what, you know, you guys weren't able to see the changes they made between, maybe they made some changes they shouldn't have made and that caused them to score. Maybe they moved some sources around, they pulled some, some information from their website, things like that. And then here's uh, some of the feedback they got. A lot of feedback from the judges at nationals this year. Um, it seemed that a lot of it, um, they wanted to make sure they stayed focused. Some of it made it seem like they went a little off track. Um, contextualizing stuff a little bit better. Um, pointing out other resources, other people that the students that have now spent the greater part of a year digging into um, a topic might find interesting, which they always end up looking into what the judges recommend them looking. Even if they're not moving on to the next level, kids still really get invested in their topic. Um, and then advice for them. So navigation buttons at the bottom, the interview that was helpful. Um, the interview was very long. You may have noticed that. Um, it was a very long interview and it was kind of circumvented that 1200 um, word limit. So that might have caused the little ding for them in that they were letting that interview do the talking instead of themselves um, and how that might have affected their scoring. And then um, I also had a, a senior group website that um, we can um, just to have an example of what senior work might have looked like. They did theirs on uh, the cartoon puck and how that communicated through history. They had a whole thesis page here, um, their thesis from 1876 to 1918. These cartoons revolutionized the way people viewed and understood society and politics um, and kind of what changes they did there. And um, you know how they scored at state, some of that feedback. I, I'll put this on um, the Padlet for you. If, you. if somebody is a senior teacher and yeah, it was a really great topic. Um, these girls went to, um, they did really well at state. I can't remember if they went to nationals last year too, uh, but they actually won um, a affiliate award for this work that they did. Um, and so you can look through this on the Padlet if you would like. If you have um, senior kids, you wanna see kind of the equivalent of senior work that went to nationals. Uh, some of the uh, advice they were given, feedback they were given. And then that's really um, what I have for you today. So some kind of things to take away um, as far as the rubrics. Um, if you are working with kids throughout the year with these rubrics, it kind of takes the mystery out of the judging process for them. And it makes it a little less scary, but also you're going to see room for growth because they kind of take ownership of the language that's within those squares. Um, it helps them understand that growth is a process. It's not something that happens overnight and it's something they're gonna to have to work on at each level of the competition because revision is part of it. And um, this is kind of viewing this as long form project. Uh, and it helps them gain confidence in their language, um, having them self-assess themselves and using that language in their own writing. I would, I'm curious to see what your thoughts about looking at a student project through the lens of the rubric. Um, if anybody has any thoughts or insight, um, resources that you might find helpful that we could work on for you throughout the year. As um, the summer progresses into the fall, I will be adding more and more stuff that we're making for you to the Padlet um, as we kind of get out of PD season and I get a little bit of time to make sources, resources for you. Um, so any, any advice or um, insight into what you could use, um, please let me know.